Part 6, Beethoven at the dog park. However, today we're overlooking the dog park, which is right down there. And we're enjoying the view that Beethoven enjoyed overlooking the city of Vienna as we're overlooking the city of Reno. Day to day, life was exhausting for Beethoven. His house was a mess and there were rarely any clean clothes. Riff raff, shouted Beethoven at his servants. Beethoven was lucky to have Nanette Stretcher, a young woman in Augsburg. She had adored his piano playing. Now she lived in Vienna and was married to the piano maker, Andreas Streicher. She helped Beethoven with his rundown household She'd speak patiently with cooks and maids on behalf of the deaf, distressful composer who loved paper and pencil, who shoved paper and pencils at his visitors for lengthy conversations. Countless conversation notebooks would be written by friends, volunteers, and by secretaries like Anton Schindler. The Viennese poet Franz Gil Parser with whom Beethoven wanted to write a liberato by and by Beethoven's nephew, Carl. After the death of his brother, Beethoven had assumed the guardianship of Carl. He spent a lot of his money on the boy, paying for tutors and boarding school. It was not easy to live as a freelance artist in Vienna. If he couldn't depend on the nobility, he would have to depend on the taste of the public. Beethoven thought of his art as, a, as being willful, going in new directions, always progressing. But he still had to write pieces that would have mass appeal. He called it lowering himself to the common man. Lowering himself. To gain the time and money for a new piece, I first must please the masses, he thought. It was working on he was working on two large pieces, pieces that would set the standard. One was a mass for his royal highness, Archduke Rudolf, whom he had been teaching for years. The other was the latest symphony, his ninth, which would feature Schindler's Ode to Joy, of which we know a lot about in our music classes. And we can pretty much all play it, right? <laughs> Um, at the same time, he wrote pieces that came from his heart. He dearly loved Josephine and passed, his dearly loved Josephine had passed away and her memory, in her memory, he composed Piano Sonata number 31 in A flat major. In the first phrase, there's a sigh, a gentle melody to which one could sing the words, Dear Josephine. Dear Josephine, she would have to hear the Miss Psalmus in the Ninth Symphony from Heaven. The Grand Mass wasn't finished until 1823. In the first part, the cry Beethoven wrote the dedication for the heart from the heart. Beethoven wanted his music to awaken and strengthen spirituality within the listeners and singers giving them a deep inner sense of God and his creative power. He hoped that this feeling would stay with people forever. On May 7, 1824, a large musical academy was brought in to play Beethoven's works. Three pieces from nine masses were presented as hymns on the program. Since religious works could not be played in public, concert halls. The Ninth Symphony had its premiere. The audience cheered and cheered. Beethoven sulked, slouched in his seat, until finally the singer Caroline Unger bent down to him. She pulled him up and gently turned him, turned him towards the audience. At last he could see their enthusiastic faces and hands 
understanding the passionate reception his music had received. He bowed gratefully. Until that point, no applause had reached him and the depths of the silence that surrounded him. Financially, however, the highest praise concert was not a success. The Prussian king to whom the Ninth Symphony was dedicated didn't send Beethoven the medals he desired, but instead sent him an expensive and inexpensive ring. Beethoven was insulted and wanted to sell it immediately. Sell it? cried the violinist Carl Holtz angrily. He wrote to his deaf friend exactly what he thought. But that is a present from a king. Pah, Beethoven answered. I'm a king too. Beethoven spent the summer of 1825 in Balden. But when he thought about fall, but then he thought about fall in Vienna. He decided to move back. It was, he was enticed by the suburb, suburb of Ashler. There was a former cloister for Spanish Benedictine monks, Benedict, ben, Benedictine monks there, which had become a part, an apartment, which had become an apartment building. Beethoven moved into a vacant apartment on the second floor. Five windows offered a marvelous view of the ramparts and towers of the city all the way to Stephen's Cathedral. So again, Beethoven is back downtown Vienna. Downtown Reno. And the seasons were getting to it and wanted to go back. Just like Tahoe has its seasons, it's snow season summer like right now <laughs> all right so he's back in Vienna in front the front room was his kitchen and servant quarters and they opened directly into the courtyard to the east one could see all the way to Prater with its old trees it was another bonus that his friend Stephen von Brennan lived in the area with his wife and son and it was so close to the cemetery where Josephine was buried. He hung the portrait of his grandfather in the front room and crammed the piano next to the bed in the first bedroom. The workroom became the composition room, which led to the kitchen. Beethoven worked on his new string quartet. He might have been quite comfortable in his new surroundings, if only his help and his family had cooperated. His worries about his nephew Carl tortured him more than any sickness ever would. Beethoven had tried so hard to take good care of him, but somehow his efforts went unrewarded. In the summer of 1826, Carl tried to commit suicide. Instead of finishing his exams at the university, he ran away, sold his watch, and bought a pistol with the proceeds. Near Balden, on the hill with the Wanstein ruins, Carl fired the pistol twice. Either he was a bad shot or he was intentionally trying to miss. The second shot hit his head and Carl fell to the ground. A man driving a cart found him and brought him at his request to his mother in Vienna. Carl was treated at a hospital, but because his injuries were the result of a suicide attempt, he was questioned by the authorities. Why did he want to die? Carl declared that he was a prisoner of his uncle's expectations. He wanted to be a soldier, but his uncle wouldn't let him. I'm worse off because my uncle pushed me to be better, said Carl. Stephen von Brennan convinced Beethoven to give up the guardianship. Carl would need a good recommendation to get into military, into the military after a suicide attempt. Von Brennan knew Lieutenant Field Marshal, and when Beethoven dedicated his new string quartet in C-sharp minor to him, 
Carl was allowed to join up as soon as his hair grew in over his head glued. Until then, Beethoven spent time with Carl in his brother Johann's country manor. Johann made sure that his brother was comfortable. He brought Beethoven the best wines while he polished the strings, the string quartets. Beethoven wrote letters that he meant to write that he meant to write for a long time to his old friends, von Wiegler and Lenore. Oh, Lachorin! Beethoven still carried her silhouette with him. He kept thinking of his time in Bonn. The things closest to his heart appeared in his music, reconciliation, peace, and joy. Every day life was a different matter. After the first few peaceful weeks, the family began to fight again. Beethoven boarded the first available coach with his nephew on December 1st, wanting to return to Vienna. It was pouring rain and an icy wind blew they spent the night frozen and wet at a tavern in an unheated room. Beethoven arrived at his apartment shaking with chills and pneumonia. The doctor also diagnosed dropsy, and he had to repeatedly drain fluid from Beethoven's stomach. Beethoven bore these horrible intrusions with unbelievable patience. On top of everything, he also had jaundice, thanks to his weak liver. During December, Carl lived with his uncle and took care of him. But by the beginning of 1827, he had to leave for the military. For once, there were no short-tempered words and no accusations, as the uncle and nephew peacefully said goodbye to each other. In fact, no one suffered any more from Beethoven's insults, not even the housekeeper, Sally. She even heard him say things like, thank you, and that was good. As long as he could, Beethoven continued to compose and write letters. These were the last days of his life. He rejoiced over every visit, every letter, every kind word, and every handshake. Friends did not abandon him, and colleagues visited him. The Philharmonic, Philharmonic Society of London sent money for his care. His former landlord had, st had stewed cherries and peaches brought, and brought them to him. Beethoven asked for specific types of wine. Laboriously, he wrote short thank you notes. May heaven bless you for your loving help. His publisher, in sent him a case of wine, wine. It's too bad, Beethoven whispered, too late. When the composer Hummel visited with his wife, Beethoven could no longer speak. Sweat beaded on his forehead. Mr. Hummel took her fine handkerchief and dried his face. He thanked her with his eyes. I just want to add my own personal note. Yes, it sounds like Beethoven was very sick, jaundice, pneumonia, having his stomach drained, just terrible situation, but he was only 56 years old at this time. He's not an old, old person. And yet the Philharmonic is taking care of him, his friends are stopping by, and now he can't, he's so sick he can't even speak to them anymore but he's only 56 years old. On March 26, 1827, in the late afternoon, there was a severe storm. Thunder pelted and lightning flashed through the snowy light. Loudly, lightning struck something nearby. Beethoven sat up one last time, balled his fist, and fell back into the pillows. 20,000 people attended Beethoven's funeral at the cemetery. The poet Franz Grillparzer wrote the eulogy, and the court actor Henrik 
Oshnooks recited it. He was an artist, but no human being, but also a human being. A human being in the words fullest meaning. But until his death, he remained a human heart towards a humane heart towards all people, a fatherly one to his family, devoted his talent and life to the whole world. So he was, so he died, so he shall live for all.